today with us we have madam geeta gopi n to take us through the session she is a rehabilitation practitioner and a psychologist ma'am is the direct director of professional development and programs as the sashaktikaran trust coachin ma'am has over 30 years of experience in helping children with special needs ma'am has worked in international schools that follow an american curriculum for inclusive settings for more than 15 years and has done intensive work in curriculum development adaptations behavioral management coordinating and promoting best educational practices using the udl principles among the staff and parents ma'am has also launched the early academic series that's a teachers kit for teaching early language skills and basic math based on the universal design of learning it's a pleasure to have you with us ma'am before i hand over the podium to ma'am i would like to inform you all that the session is for 2 hours one hour of knowledge sharing by the expert speaker and the other hour we would have the q and a segment also after 5 to 10 minutes when the expert sharing starts we would be switching the chat settings to the host and panelists wishing you all a very happy learning over to you geeta ma'am thank you shivani uh, a warm good evening to all the participants um who are going to participate in this workshop thank you for having me again <laughs> i've become almost a very familiar face on the ability platforms now so looking forward to this session again so uh, shall we get started yeah okay so i'll just start with sharing my screen Yes. So today's uh, topic is an extension from uh, the previous workshop that I had held, which was on an introduction to speaking and listening. So today we are going to talk about developing speaking and listening skills in children with special needs, the different strategies and the techniques we can employ so that uh, children with special needs can achieve these skills and overcome the challenges that are posed. Uh, before them especially in the academic uh, settings so just to do a quick recap of uh, what we uh, did last in the previous workshop we had delved uh, you know um, in extensive um, format uh, we had gone about the milestones of language development we had also talked about the different kinds of challenges that children with special needs experience and uh, because of those challenges what are the impacts it has on speech and language development and consequently how it affects uh, speaking and listening we had also talked about the different uh, strategies and techniques and overview on uh, how to develop english language skills particularly in the listening and uh, speaking area and why remedial or supportive um, english uh, services remedial education and supportive services are necessary for children with special needs uh, and how to go about uh, doing it we had kind of just uh, touched upon these elements in our previous workshop and today's workshop we are going to go a little bit further into this we are going to learn about what exactly are speaking and listening skills how can we uh, improve these skills uh, uh, how do these skills affect children who have different special needs conditions then uh, we will also be talking about the different techniques on uh, and different activities that can be used uh, employed um, in a home setting in a school setting especially in an inclusive school setting to improve the listening and speaking skills in children who have challenges and who don't develop these skills in a uh, typical manner so to go about what is language development uh, language development is a very very important and crucial part of a child's overall what we call as the child development so in, in any uh, child there are different domains that develop when we talk about child development and one of the very very important uh, domain is also language speech and language development and the foundations of the uh, the foundational skills that contribute to and you know further uh, given impetus to language development are 
listening and speaking, reading and writing. So uh, uh, when language develops, it develops, it manifests in these kind of skill areas, especially these four skill areas, which are very predominantly used in acquiring uh, academic skills. So in a school situation, when you talk about school situation, uh, these are the four main pillars of language development, which are necessary uh, to be uh, in a, you know, functioning in a typical manner so as to enable the child to function optimally in the school setting. Now, do, just to do a, a quick recap on the different phases of language development, uh, one thing to remember, uh, uh, which I had also mentioned in the previous uh, workshop, is that there's a big spurt of language development in early childhood. The first 12 months actually lays the foundation for uh, skills uh, and, uh, you know, which are, uh, which promote the, uh, the, the, the development of speech and language. And the speech and language in turn promotes listening, speaking, and the other uh, literacy and numeracy skills. So the first one year is kind of laying the foundation for these skills. And then the three to, uh, from 12 year, uh, 12 months or a year to three to five years age range is you see a big spurt in the amount of language, uh, both receptive as well as expressive language that children acquire. And language development, just like it, it is with other aspects of child development, it doesn't happen uh, in a silo or in isolation. It goes concurrently with other uh, domain developments, such as the sensory motor areas, the social skill areas, the cognitive skill areas, and so on. So all these, uh, you know, uh, development of skills in all these areas go side by side, hand in hand, and they feed on each other. So when we talk about uh, children with special needs who may have delays or deviancies in the kind of development in the normal so-called normal child development that takes place, it is to be understood that when we are talking about language development and developing language uh, skills in children who have these challenges, we need to act as early as possible because the major spurt of development takes place in early childhood. Therefore. Uh, the kind of stimulation or intervention that we give will have the maximum beneficial effect if we act in those uh, that time period. So acting early is very, very important to promote holistic development and particularly so in the language, speech and language as well as speaking and listening areas. And uh, again, as I said, uh, because uh, language development goes hand in hand with development in other domains, while we are working on speech and language development, other domain skills should also go concurrently. So it is only when all these come together, it's like a, a, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle being put together. So if one piece is missing, you can definitely say the picture will not be complete. So uh, similarly, all these domain uh, developments should be worked on simultaneously and concurrently so that the development becomes more holistic and complete. Just to uh, do a quick touch on the developmental milestones, uh, zero to three months, which is the, uh, you know, after the child is born to three months of age, uh, social smile develops, which is considered a social skill, but again, is a very important uh, part of, uh, you know, future speech and language development because it facilitates social interaction. It facilitates, uh, you know, making eye contact with the person in front of you and so on. Differentiated cry. Differentiated cry is when the child cries, the cry is slightly different for different needs. So if the child is uh, in pain or it needs uh, is hungry, the cry is usually a little bit different and which usually the primary caregiver or the mother is uh, very perceptive to and can make out. Uh, enjoys the melody or a lullaby or something that they hear repeatedly. Uh, they recognize that and they seem to enjoy that. For, for example, many of the countries, you know, uh, you, you, you sing a lullaby or you put a rhythm on, uh, uh, you tap the child on the back with a certain kind of rhythm, which uh, helps put the child to sleep. So all these things do form part of uh, receptive uh, language and it lays the foundation for future speech and language. 
by the time the child is, uh, you know, uh, so this continues, it gets more and more refined and the other motor skills will be happening at the same time. And by say six to eight months to, to a year, a lot of expressive language development takes place. It becomes more refined. Uh, the child starts re uh, reacting to sudden noises or un unfamiliar noises in the environment when people speak to them. Uh, people in the immediate environment speak to them. They appear to be listening and responding. Uh, the response may not have taken the form of words, but they still respond in the form of gurgles or cooing or, you know, uh, just sounds which express happiness, satisfaction, yeah. etc. They also begin to use, you know, repetitive uh, sounds such as baba, dada, etc. Again, not exact words, but more in the form of babbling where uh, the child is more like exercising control over their oral muscles and you know enjoying the placement of the tongue the teeth uh, uh, the lips etc in different ways to produce different uh, speech sounds they also try and uh, make uh, different kinds of facial expressions or different kinds of noises to express different kinds of feelings uh, they begin to understand things, makes more sense about the things with the environment, especially, you know, which relates to sound, such as looking towards the source of a sound. Um, you know, a uh, reaction is, uh, you know, very elated when they hear a familiar voice of a familiar person in the family. And notice that toys make sounds, you know, you can bang or shake toys to uh, create sounds uses babbling more for communicative intent. Like for example, when they see the mother, the word may be not, but they may probably bring out the uh, mama sound. Okay, more in the end. Probably that will extend to all women, maybe the grandmother in the house or the aunt, et cetera, until they be it begins to refine itself and get into the first words. So from one to two years more, uh, you know, by the first year, uh, the first words develop, single word develops. And then from one to two years, again, it uh, further gets refined. The children begin to clap to certain rhythm. They begin to enjoy music. They're able to move according to a certain beat uh, or music or rhythm. Uh, the single word utterances get further developed and they start joining two words to form small phrases such as, you know, come here, want milk and so on. So two word phrases start appearing, simple basic directions. If you give them some instructions like, you know, clap your hands or put the, uh, take this thing and put it there, they begin to follow these simple one, one step directions. Between two to three years, the vocabulary really goes through a big jump uh, from, you know, a few words which were like eight to 10 words in the first uh, one to two years uh, age range. It jumps up almost until 50 plus words. They begin to answer, uh, answer the questions posed to them in simple ways. They begin to use little pronouns such as referring themselves to themselves as I or me, et cetera. Three to four years sees a big, big jump in the way this, uh, the, the complexity of skills that uh, develop in the speech and language area. They're able to talk in you know, simple sentences, three to four or even longer word uh, sentences vocabulary increases considerably. There's a big, big spurt in the amount of vocabulary that uh, the child is able to use, nearly a thousand words. Um, they can relate experiences. They can uh, probably say a story or recall something that has happened in the near uh, immediate past and tell it to other people and so on. By the time they come to four to five years, which is like the entry of school entry years, by then most children can speak uh, you know, in sentences of four to five uh, words at least, they begin to use past tense, you know, so the kind of language, the vocabulary they kind of, uh, tend to use becomes more and more refined and more and more precise, depending on what they want to convey. Vocabulary, again, goes through a major spurt. And by this time, the children have usually a vocabulary of 1,500 uh, plus words. And even receptive language, like from uh, being able to carry out or follow directions, which were one step directions, it moves on to multi-step. You can tell them two, three different things, and then you know they will be able to still do it. So you can say, uh, give a direction such as, you know, pick up the uh, cup from here, 
and go and put it into the uh, sink in the kitchen. And, you know, uh, they would be able to do that, carry that out. Multi-step directions will be, uh, they will be able to follow this and carry through. So we, uh, we have seen like, a, you know, a, a run through over how complex and how it seems very slow in the first year. And then it goes through big jumps and further, uh, you know, sudden bursts of a speech and language development and speaking and listening skills happen uh, between the three to five year age range. So coming back to, you know, the, the, the core topic that we're dealing with today, uh, listening. So what is listening? Uh, listening is a very, very active process in which we try to uh, receive the information in an accurate manner and interpret or understand or comprehend these information messages or information that we are hearing from the environment, either that is being said by other people or through media, like what we hear from television or the other media sources. Uh, speaking, on the other hand, is the other uh, end. It is a process of expressing. So uh, listening is a receptive process, whereas speaking is a, an expressive process. It is a process by which we express uh, or we respond to or we answer back or reply to any information or message that we receive in a, uh, through verbal means or orally, through the uh, production of speech. So... Uh, uh, when we talk about listening and speaking, two very important co uh, cornerstones, which actually form the crux of communication. Going a little bit de uh, deeper into listening skills, uh, what does listening skill require? It requires a very, very basic, uh, uh, you know, basic ability to be able to focus attention on a speaker for a considerable amount of time. So if somebody is speaking to us, uh, the child needs to be able to direct and sustain attention on that speaker for a, for a certain length of time in order to hear what the other person is saying and also to process and understand what the other person is trying to say. And it is, a, as I said earlier, it is a receptive skill because we are actually receiving the information and then it requires both our, our hearing apparatus, that is the ears, and our thinking or processing apparatus, which is the brain, uh, both to work in a very efficient manner so that we can understand what is being spoken to us, uh, either through people or through other, uh, other media. So why are these skills so important? Particularly when we uh, come into, you know, we are talking of this whole program is about inclusive schooling. So when we talk about the schooling situation, you know, and with respect to that, why do we think uh, listening skills are important? What is the aim or uh, what does it seek to achieve? So the purpose of listening is uh, manifold. Uh, one is to be able to understand and follow the instructions. So when the teacher or the parent or the therapist is giving certain instructions, this child needs to be able to understand what is being told and be able to uh, carry through those activities or carry through those instructions. So that is one uh, need for, be, for having uh, listening skills. Another one is to understand what is the speaker intending. So for example, if you're attending a lecture, you're attending this workshop. When you are listening to me speaking, uh, you are able to uh, you know, determine what is the message that I am trying to convey, on what topic am I speaking? What are the different aspects of that topic that I'm speaking? So similarly, in a school situation also, when the teacher is you know, giving out a lot of information or giving out directions or directing the children and guiding the children through certain activities. Uh, children need to be able to understand what is this teacher trying to say? What is, uh, what is it that the teacher wants them to do? So to be able to determine what the speaker is intending by whatever she is saying. Uh, the third is to be able to respond or to reply or to answer back to what the speaker is saying. So if the teacher is saying something, asking something, to be able to uh, you know, answer back. And it should depend on you know, whatever topic the teacher is speaking at the moment. So to be able to thoughtfully respond, not just give any response, 
but to thoughtfully respond depending upon the situation, upon the topic that is being spoken, uh, that is under discussion and so on. So uh, the responses, uh, you know, that the children have to give should, should be based or contingent upon the speaker or and the topic or the uh, the, uh, the 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 background of what the speaker is uh, uh, giving information on. Uh, then, of course, there's the aesthetic part or the more um, you know uh, leisure part or the aesthetic or the cultural uh, ramifications of listening, which is to be able to enjoy the more finer parts of life, like you know, be able to appreciate music, be able to listen to stories, be able to um, listen uh, uh, and understand performances such as you know drama or movies uh, television programs and so on so to be able to uh, you know engage in and understand uh, all these things such as music you know uh, live performances or audiovisual medium um, uh, listening to stories or you know puppet shows etc so all these things are uh, uh, finally add on to the repertoire of being able to receive, uh, understand, and make better sense of the world through active listening. So this is why listening skills are very, very important. Then coming to speaking skills. What are speaking skills? And it, this is uh, speaking skills can be very easily defined as a medium, a verbal medium using our oral apparatus through which by using speech or words, we can convey uh, information to other people. And it is uh, more of a uh, productive skill. That is, we produce those speech sounds or words or sentences. So it is more of an expressive skill that for which we, we have to use certain parts of our body, certain muscles, the vocal cords, the vocal tract, and also, again, the processing of the language which uh, comes with the brain. So it is the vocal uh, mechanisms, the oromotor mechanism, along with the brains, which help us in uh, good speaking skills. So which help us to produce the right kind of words, the right kind of sounds in the more efficient manner, so as to convey what we have to say. And again, just as with speaking skills, why do we need, uh, oh, sorry, as, just as it, it is with listening skills, why do we need speaking skills, the purpose of speaking. Uh, you know, first and foremost, it is a, it has a communicative intent. That is, if we need to express our needs or wants orally to somebody. So, you know, if, uh, for example, a child needs, to, needs food or is hungry, to be able to ask for it. Um, you know, so being able to express one's own needs and wants in a, verbally is one of the one of the basic needs for being able to speak. Second is to be able to respond to uh, the questions that are asked. So especially like in a school setting or even in a home setting, when parents or caregivers or teachers are asking things, um, you know, they need to be able to respond appropriately uh, to the questions that are being asked. So it can come from a very simple thing, what happens in your environment in early childhood, to you know, more complex uh, answering to more complex questions, such as when you come into schools, when you're dealing with subject content matter, etc. So it has a wide range of uh, implications. And then uh, third one is to make a listener understand a certain topic. Now this becomes again very important, especially in a school setting, because if the child has to stand up in front of the classroom, speak about a certain topic or do an oral presentation, or, you know, uh, again, retell a story, for example. So all these things require, uh, you know, certain amount of um, fluency in uh, verbal skills, which is speaking skills. So speaking skills are intended to not only just express basic needs and wants and so on, but to also to clarify, to respond to questions, to make yourself understood, to show your display, your knowledge about a certain uh, topic and so on. So both these skills form the cornerstone of all uh, academic learning. And they are a huge, huge, if not one of the most important part in a child's learning process, particularly uh, the academic learning process. So effective learning 
you know happens only when there are when there are uh, good speaking and listening skills in children and uh, when you develop when you do things which promote healthy speaking and listening it helps in overall receptive and expressive language development as well so you know it's both actually speaking and listening is a part of receptive expressive language development and what this does is you know having a uh, good speaking and listening skills lead to uh, it actually triggers leads to and further refines facilitates and modifies the reading and writing skills that are then introduced in the preschool and schooling years so uh, you know the when we talk about uh, language development we commonly say lsrw which is listening speaking reading and writing so listening and speaking come first and it leads into reading and writing and uh, vice versa as well because through reading and writing too you can develop good speaking they are very much interdependent and inter um, you know in, uh, interdependent as well as uh, you know, it both feed into each other so uh, when you do listening and speaking activities it promotes reading and writing and when you do reading and writing activities you can incorporate a lot of your listening and speaking skills in that as well so they, it works both ways now to talk about certain um, checklists and tools when we talk about listening and speaking skills uh, in the earlier workshop i had also mentioned that one of the ways uh, we have to uh, promote speaking and listening skills is teach these skills targetedly uh, you know use uh speaking and listening skills as uh, learning objectives make them part of your uh make them part of the learning process make them part of your educational program and for that you know some of the questions that people did ask last time and i'm putting forth a bit more information on that is you know how do we what skills do we teach so one of the uh, since we are talking about inclusive schooling and we are talking about you know a child's progression through the schooling years one of the uh, best uh, guidelines to follow would be the school curriculum itself if you look at most of the school curricula almost all school curricula throughout the world uh, especially in the language areas whether it is while you're teaching english or any other uh, language the language textbooks themselves will have different set of skills that need to be covered different vocabulary that need to be covered and so on and in all these curricula you find they have a section on speaking and listening skills so it will be clearly mentioned that at the end of this unit or this theme or this chapter lesson whatever uh, you, the child will be able to uh, uh, understand or comprehend these things or be able to listen to a story and ans answer these questions so there will be clear demarcation and listing out of what speaking and listening skills are being uh you know targeted through those uh lessons so follow the school curriculum that's a very very good uh, uh guideline to follow but with children who uh, do have deficiencies who do have uh, difficulties uh, many of them even when they are entering the school age or school curriculum they may still have a lot of uh, developmental delays and deviances which means their listening and speaking skills may not be adequately developed so in those cases you know and also if even before schooling years since we talked about acting as early as possible for uh, you know uh, fixing or for remediating speech and language issues we need to also think about preschooling years uh, especially the early developmental years and if the child is already showing the, uh, you know delays or deviances in those uh, at those times we need to work on speaking and listening and receptive expressive language skills right from there so there uh, you know a lot of developmental checklists can um, come in handy there are plenty available uh, but some of the most commonly used ones are uh, you know one is the elors or the early learning observation and rating scale uh, by mary colman uh, gills and um, right and uh, these uh, elors is one where you have a checklist of uh, skills in all different domains of child development but they also have a domain where communication of uh, receptive and expressive language skills are also listed out and you'll find this very common with all the developmental checklists they won't just have speaking listening skills 
Uh, but they will have one domain, which is usually the language domain or the communication domain, and your speaking, listening, receptive, expressive language skills would be listed there. And uh, why these development uh, checklists are also useful is because you'll have the other domains, you know, which go hand in hand also there. So you can have a kind of correlation between uh, the other areas that also need to be developed along with um, speech and language. So it becomes more wholesome when you're providing intervention. Uh, another uh, very uh, commonly used, uh, again, with a big emphasis on speech and language is called Comdeal. It is a developmental checklist uh, developed by a very uh, famous speech and language pathologist from India, uh, Dr. Pratibha Karan. And Comdeal, again, it's not just a checklist, but it also comes with a huge it of uh, different um, activities that can be done for developing different kinds of uh, speaking and listening skills. And most of them are directed towards very young children or, or you know, skills that are necessary uh, to be developed in early childhood. Madras Developmental Programming System, uh, which is brought out by Human Services, uh, Vijay Human Services Chennai. Again, MDPS as is commonly known as uh, again, this is usually used with children who have intellectual disabilities, but again, along with different domains, it also has a domain called communicator, uh, communication, and therein you can find, you know, you can find guidelines on different kinds of um, uh, skills that are necessary for uh, speaking and listening. Basic MR, uh, which is brought out by the National Institute for Mentally Handicapped, uh, now known as National Institute for Empowerment of Persons with Intellectual Disabilities. Again, uh, here, the all uh, this also, again, it, although it is intended for children with intellectual disabilities, it can also be used with other kinds of special needs conditions. Again, here you have, uh, you know, behaviors and uh, different kinds of responses enlisted in all kinds of domains that travels the child development, uh, neuro, uh, normal child development, but it also has a section on uh, communication. So therefore, you know, that can act as a, an indicator. There's another one again brought out by the same uh, National Institute of uh, NIMH or now as NIPIT called ARAM, uh, which is more like a school readiness package which, uh, uh, with special emphasis on childhood inclusive education. Uh, in RM again, uh, this is, um, you know, uh, it is from uh, mostly from three to six years of age, where a lot of skills that are, re are required for entering the schools are listed. And uh, one good fact about RM is that it also gives, you know, how you can modify certain aims or objectives or skills with regard to different kinds of um, developmental disabilities. So if it's a child with, say, ASD or autism spectrum, how you can modify that particular thing. Or if it's a child with CP or with visual impairment or hearing impairment, how that particular skill can be uh, adapted to suit, suit the challenges that this particular uh, child with, impair, uh, you know, uh, a certain kind of disability has. So you will find that many of these checklists and tools um, are uh, very, you know, especially if you're looking for the special needs aspect of it, many of them are, you know, kind of uh, related to intellectual disabilities or autism spectrum disorders and so on. Otherwise, uh, you can go into any early intervention uh, developmental checklist and, uh, you know, you can make use of it. There's also one that I haven't mentioned here, which again is pretty much used in different parts of the world called the Carolina Curriculum. Again, uh, Carolina Curriculum 2, uh, what it does is it does, it isn't just a checklist. It has, you know, different things that you can use as activities um, for furthering, uh, you know, speak, uh, speaking and language skills. But otherwise, for all practical purposes, especially in the school settings, I would say go through the school curriculum and, you know, uh, go through what are the skills that are enlisted there and take your children through the speaking and listening skills that are listed out in the school curriculum. Going by uh, research, a lot of research uh, has happened in this area and one such is by uh, Lerv Ag and Human Melby, uh, which is conducted in 2017, which says that supporting a child's early development of speaking and listening skills are absolutely critical for the development of 
literacy skills, especially reading and writing skills. And therefore, it is uh, very important that if you see a child having a delay in this area, that it needs to be addressed, whether the child has an established disability or not. If you even find that th there is a delay and you know uh, there is uh, there are difficulties in the child acquiring these skills, it needs to be addressed as as quickly as uh, noticed. So don't wait until you know uh, the delay has set in considerably and gaps in learning have formed. Because all uh, speaking and listening um, skill delays or uh, you know are indicative of a possible academic difficulty later on. So rather than wait till the academic difficulty actually manifests itself, you can start acting early and set right the, the precursors to academic development, the reading and writing development, which is speaking and listening skills. So what are the different challenges affecting uh, the development of speaking and listening skills? Uh, special needs, different kinds of special needs conditions uh, uh, you know, pose different kinds of challenges. And uh, basically, whatever the challenges are, what it actually does is it hampers what we know, uh, call as the normal speech and language development. It causes, uh, sometimes it just causes a delay. Sometimes there's a deviancy. That is, uh, children begin to listen or speak or express themselves in ways that are not typical of children for that age. So these things may occur. And this uh, results in because speech and language development, receptive and uh, expressive language development is impaired or delayed, uh, or there are skill, uh, certain skills that are deficient in them, it will affect uh, those gaps will ultimately affect literacy and numeracy skills, which is acquiring reading, writing and basic math skills in when they enter school. So uh, because it has a direct bearing, we need to understand what are the different special needs conditions that pose, uh, you know, that uh, pose challenges to developing good listening and speaking skills. Some of these barriers are, some of these conditions are, one is hearing impairment. If children are unable to hear, if they have a hearing loss, uh, definitely uh, their in, uh, the language input that goes into them, the receptive language that goes into them is hampered, especially since we learn language a lot through listening. So if the auditory modality as, is uh, impaired, then definitely uh, the reception is affected. So therefore, the expression will also be affected. So therefore, if you have a child with hearing impairment, the first and foremost thing to do is uh, go to an audiologist, a speech pathologist, an audiologist, get the hearing, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the severity level of hearing assessed see what kind of aids, hearing aids, et cetera, is suitable for that particular child to help the uh, child reap the man maximum benefit out of it. Uh, if it is, uh, and then uh, provide speech therapy and speech and language therapy alongside uh, providing the hearing aid because uh, uh, they will require the help of both these uh, services to become uh, functional in go uh, and develop age appropriate uh, speaking and listening skills. And also some, uh, some of the persons with hearing impairment may not uh, develop good speech uh, skills. They may develop uh, reasonably um, uh, good listening skills or um, a, a, a compensatory mechanism such as lip reading to listening skills, but they may also uh, not be able to fully speak verbally. So you might need to consider um, other uh, modifications uh, for them to express their uh, express themselves such as sign language and later on reading and writing so uh, depending on the uh, on the severity condition depending on what the person or the child needs suitable uh, uh, speaking and listening intervention has to be given and if there needs to be accommodations and modifications made alternate methods given to compensate for the deficit in speaking and listening, so be it, you have to provide that. The second condition is autism spectrum disorders. Again, here the major breakdown is in the communication area as well as the social interaction area. And uh, some of these children also have other sensory, uh, sensory issues or behavioral issues 
bizarre kind of repetitive behaviors or repetitive oral, uh, you know, echolalia, what we call as. And many of these kind of behaviors may be there. Some of them may have intellectual disability also in addition to ASD. So all these compounds, uh, their speech and uh, the problems they face in the speech and language area. And therefore, uh, you may have to think of uh, targeted activities, not only to develop and bring them back on track, but also if need be to think of alternate ways of uh, uh, alternatives to the, what we call as normal speaking and listening skills. Same goes with uh, cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a condition where the, uh, you know, the movement uh, is hampered, the muscle movement, joint movements, etc., may be hampered. And because of that speech production, uh, may be affected. Some of the children with CP also have intellectual disability. So that means cognitive functioning may also be affected, which means both receptive and expressive language may be affected. So here again, you may have to think of alternative uh, ways on how to develop good speaking and uh, listening skills or alternate ways of you know, uh, receiving and expressing. Global developmental delay, uh, which is like in the early stages, when there is a delay in all the domains, you know, all the uh, child developmental domains, such as motor skills, uh, social skills, communication, uh, and so on, all these are affected. And there's a delay, uh, a consistent delay seen in all the different areas, which eventually kind of develops into intellectual disability. Because when they have a, a general intellectual, uh, you know, Subaverage functioning, it develops, uh, you know, it, uh, the development in all domains will be uh, delayed. So, you know, global developmental delay may be there. And with these children, again, because, uh, you know, their, uh, their capability of understanding is lesser compared to, you know, their age, uh, their peer group, definitely the receptive language will be ex uh, affected and therefore expressive language as well in turn would be affected. In children who have um, specific learning disorder. Now, this is where, where children do have average or above average or near average intellectual functioning. But what happens is uh, in specific learning disorder, the difficulty lies in language processing, particularly with re relation to reading, writing. It manifests more there, but it does have its implications in visual and auditory processing, both of which, of which are, uh, you know, uh, are necessary for good speaking and listening skills. So many of these children may show some delay in speech and language. They may do, and they may have a difficulty find, uh, discriminating between different speech sounds, et cetera. So you may find children uh, with SLD may uh, have difficulty about, uh, you know, uh, uh, producing the right ki uh, kinds of sounds. Pronunciation difficulties may be commonly seen or maybe speaking fluently. And if they have, you know, additional comorbid situations like ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and so on, along with uh, these uh, conditions, then that adds on to the problem of uh, developing skills in all areas, but it definitely affects speaking and listening skills. So uh, depending on what the child's condition is, uh, whether if it is a diagnosed condition, or even if it is not a diagnosed condition, depending on where the child's, um, you know, the current level of functioning are and where the child needs to go from there, we need to understand that good speaking and listening skills are important. And with all these children, there are certain things that are affected. Um, so what are the things that are affected when, ch when you, uh, you know, because of the challenges that different special needs condition pose? Uh, because uh, of uh, special, the dif uh, difficulties they have uh, in different areas and because of poor speak, uh, listening, speaking skills that develop, well, some of the ramifications or some of the implications we see in a school setting is one is being able to follow instructions uh, accurately. So being able to receive and act upon the instructions given Two is to be able to express themselves, to be able to convey to the teacher or to the parent uh, or to the you know, others in their environment about what their needs are or what their wants are. Being able to have a social interaction or a conversation by communicating with their peers, family members, others in the home and school environment. Being able to hold on to a conversation, uh, you know, um, stay on topic, 
and hold a conversation, wait for their turn, listen to the speaker, and then speak when it is their turn and so on. So being able to follow the nuances and the rules in a conversation and hold on to that topic without diverting. Being able to uh, communicate well uh, and develop good reading and writing skills. And then it being able to um, you know, uh, develop a higher order academic skills, which are heavily, heavily dependent on all these other skills that I've mentioned. So when we come into middle school or high school, many of these basic skills, if they are impaired, definitely it'll have a snowball or a ripple effect on the higher order uh, skills. So what are the different strategies and techniques to develop uh, speaking and listening skills in children with special needs? So what are the different uh, techniques we, uh, we have to look at when we uh, think of developing good listening skills in children? First and foremost, uh, maintain good eye contact. They should have a good eye contact and maintain that be able to you know, focus and maintain and sustain attention on the speaker for a certain length of time, being able to process and understand the information that is being spoken. If there are background noises, like in a school setting and so on, be able to filter out all these extraneous noises, uh, you know, uh, filter out, shut out the distractions and be able to focus on only what is being, uh, you know, on what is necessary. So if there is, a background noise in a school, or if there are other happenings in the in a large classroom, being able to uh, you know uh, shut those things out and just focus on the teacher who is giving the instructions. Turn the body to the speaker and listen actively. So uh, you know to listen actively means you're not just looking at the person, but you're actually trying to process the information and be able to understand what is being expected out of you. Uh, and then if you don't understand what the speaker is telling, uh, what the teacher is saying, you know, be able to ask relevant questions, to be able to clarify your doubts, to be able to ask the person to retell or re repeat what they're saying so that uh, you can improve your own understanding. So all these things are part of good listening skills. So it's not just being able to sit and hear something, yeah. just being able to do all these different behaviors. So if you don't understand, even being able to request for clarification, being able to ask questions and, uh, you know, to, to clarify your own doubts or, your, you know, or to, uh, to remind yourself of what the instructions were and so on. All this is part of developing good listening skills. Techniques for developing good speaking skills. Again, goes without saying, you know, when you're speaking to someone, maintain uh, good eye contact, make proper eye contact, maintain good eye contact, speak clearly. Well, that is uh, speak with clarity so that you can make yourself understood to the other person. Speak at an even speed, like do not go too fast or do not go too slow, but you know, speak at an even speed, which makes yourself intelligible and understandable to the, uh, to the listener. Speak with the right kind of expression. So if you are uh, commanding somebody or giving an order, the tone of speech is different. If you're asking a question, it's different. If you're requesting something, uh, you want a favor from somebody, the tone is different. If you're just plainly stating facts, the tone is different. So being able to use the right kind of intonation or expression in your speech to be able to convey. So not just using the words in the sentences, but also the right kind of uh, tone of voice, the speed, the fluency with which you speak, how clearly you're able to make the other person understand all that you're trying to convey. All this forms part of good speaking skills. Use the right kind of vocabulary. So, you know, to convey what you want to say. So uh, uh, if you're trying to describe something, for example, not just use generic terms such as good or beautiful or nice, but go beyond that and be able to, you know, use more greater vocabulary to describe something. So uh, again, so that requires us, uh, you know, a lot of uh, different kinds of word power, which is what we prominent, uh, prominently call vocabulary. So to have uh, a good vocabulary um, uh, set within yourself and to be able to recall it and use it appropriately in uh, given situations. 
be able to speak you know in sentences in uh, you know in uh, lengthier sentences and not just give one or two word answers or sometimes just some sometimes you find a lot of these children if you ask something they even they don't even give one yes or no answers even though they can speak they're just trying to you know shrug their shoulder or just make a noise which say which indicates no or yes and you know those kind of things. so not to limit themselves to just you know minimal utterances but trying to expand upon the kind of uh, utterances that they um, they uh, they produce so that they can make themselves uh, you know communicate more effective to use appropriate facial expressions uh, and gestures which go with uh, the speech uh, that they are saying so for example if you are talking about something sad or you are so talking about uh, giving some you know not very nice very unhappy news obviously we won't smile and laugh when we are doing that right so we we keep a proper facial expression we have the right kind of gestures when we are trying to do that if you are trying to comfort somebody you know the words we use or the gestures like pat on the back or you know to hold hands and make them feel comfortable all this forms part of uh, total communication so uh, it's not enough that you just say the words otherwise we'll all become like you know the computer generated speech that comes up which is without any emotion without any social connect so uh, uh, to be able to be a good speaker you need to able uh, to be able to have uh, the right kind of facial expressions the right kind of uh, voice intonations uh, as well as body language and gestures that go with what you're trying to express or communicate so what are the different kinds of techniques or activities we can make use of i would really like the participants to come forth here and uh, try and you know um, and give some suggestions on what are the different activities uh, you think can be done to help with uh, you know different speaking and listening skills they are suggesting role play storytelling story sequencing okay. role play story time drama okay yeah uh, so all these right. and much more also there's pretend play, play tongue twisters read Good. clearly yeah. playing music storytelling yes. singing flash card activities ask them to speak about their toys describe an event or a picture repeat after me blowing bubbles show and tell tongue twisters rhymes okay i think uh, they've touched upon a great deal Simon of areas says, yeah. yeah a lot of areas that are actually required for activities to develop uh, listening and speaking skills um uh here uh, we do know that all these activities which we call as hands on activities or you know things like role play uh, uh, etc do help but you know even through worksheets uh, there are worksheets which can also help through you know teaching and listening skills so i know that uh, many of these um, games music uh, action songs uh, drama all these are very good ways of Uh, and those are the ones that first come into our minds but uh, you know paper pencil activities can also be used for speaking and listening skills so i'm just giving an uh, a few examples here this is one example of a listening skills activity i mean on the left side you find some pictures there uh, each a sheet can be given to each child in the classroom and this is very school oriented so you can do these activities in classrooms uh and then uh the on the right hand side you find eight directions which remain with the teacher and normally what we do is we tell the children to be you know to put on their uh you know uh to be uh, to be active listeners and be focused uh sit up straight be in the right kind of posture ready to listen and we usually say that each direction will not be repeated more than two times or three times whichever usually it's two times that we say so we repeat say direction number 1 color the grasshopper green and then the children have to do it on the response sheet which has the pictures with the different kinds of bugs 
uh, number two is color the be yellow. So they have to do that. So uh, the materials have to be provided beforehand. Uh, the, uh, you know, before you even start the listening activity, you should uh, make sure that these children have all these different colors. Or else you can even change the directions a little bit. You can say color, instead of color, you can say circle and so on if you're just using a pencil. So, uh, you know, you can circle the bug or draw a line under the butterfly, um, you know, uh, draw one more circle inside the ladybug. You know, you can change directions as you wish, but have a, a clear set of directions. And then you can also evaluate uh, the response sheet and see where these children are, whether they have deficiencies in uh, listening skills or not. And, and quite often when I taught uh, in inclusive schools, especially in the early uh, grades, the primary grades, at least uh, once, um, twice a week, at least we would do activities like this. When you do speaking and listening competence in every activity uh, you're doing, any, any kind of a concept you're teaching. But apart from that, there were specific learning, uh, listening activities like this, which was done, which uh, again, you find in the early times, maybe in the beginning of the year, some of the children may not have had good listening skills. You will find that they seem to do much better as the uh, days go on and you know, as you uh, come towards the end of the academic year. So this is one example of how a paper pencil activity can be uh, used as a listening skills activity. This is another similar one. You know, Usually I have these kind of uh, response sheets made. It's numbered one to 10. And again, having something like this, you can use it for any age range level. The only thing is if you're using it for younger children, you can make the instructions really simple. And when you use the same thing for older children, you can you know, uh, give in more complicated directions. So for example, um, normally we give the instructions that there are 10 boxes, 10 pictures in each. Please listen to the direction, which, may be, which will be repeated twice and then perform as required. So you can say something like, you know, um, for example, if it's a very young, if it's very, you know, say grade one, grade two level children, you can say draw a, a, a draw a small circle inside the green circle in box number one. Uh, in box number two, you can say draw a circle outside the yellow triangle. Uh, box number three, inside the square, put a cross. You know, something as simple as that. Now, when it comes to older kids, you can probably give the uh, slightly more complicated uh, directions. Uh, you can, again, where you want to see how sharp their listening skills are. So for example, you can say in box number one, now this is a slightly advanced uh, direction. In box number one, inside the green circle, write the word red. So, you know, to see uh, a lot of times you'll find those are not listening carefully. They might write the word green itself because they're seeing the green circle. So again, you know, uh, be, uh, making slightly more complicated uh, directions as you go along, that can help. You can even ask them to, you know, uh, do things like draw something like, you know, for example, number six is a duck. So you can ask uh, them to uh, draw where the duck uh, way, uh, way, uh, the, which is the nat natural habitat of the drug. For example, if you're teaching those topics in science, for example, if you're teaching animal, uh, this thing, you can even make that as a direction, you know, ducks live in a pond. So probably, you know, then they have to think about, okay, what is the habitat? It is a pond and therefore draw a pond. Uh, or you can say in number five, for example, you see the picture of a heart. Uh, if you're teaching symmetry in math, you know, you can uh, say draw a line of symmetry across the. So you're not only reviewing your math concept, but you're also using it as a listening skills activity. So you can do different things like this, even in the flower pot, for example, the flower vase that is given in number seven, you can ask them to uh, draw this many flowers or, you know, draw to, uh, or if you know the, um, if they are learning about different kinds of flowers, you can say draw two tulips, uh, two uh, dahlias or whatever. And so on. So you can make the uh, instructions as complicated as you want, depending upon the group of children you're working with. Uh, you can use also use uh, this listening sheet for prepositions. Very good ones you can say on directions. You know, like uh, draw a star to the left of the, um, uh, you know, to the left of the Christmas tree, or draw uh, uh, two birds above the chimney of the house, and so on. 
So again, depending on whatever, you know, you can incorporate a listening uh, skills activity into whatever other academic skills that you're teaching, say in language or in math or in science and so on, and try and bring that into your listening uh, skills activity. This is another one, similar one, but again, slightly more advanced, which is what I was talking about. Um, the previous one was where the one response sheet itself can be used in different ways for different uh, age groups and uh, levels. Here, this is about a listen and draw thing, about whether listen, draw, listen and write, where the advanced questions are given. They have to go to box A and they have to write what season comes after summer. So they have to basically write the answer to the question. Uh, the B, they have to draw something like the uh, weather wind or the, uh, you know, the wind vane. Uh, go to box C, you have to write how many seasons do you have in your country uh, where you're living in a year. So again, the, quest the questions are complicated. They're not similar kinds. So the child has to really listen. Um, and, and also most of these questions are based upon a particular kind of uh, topic, say maybe a science topic on you know, weather. So again, uh, you are using a listening, speaking skills and response sheet um, according to the uh, complexity of the children that you're dealing with. Speaking skills activity, you can have these flashcards where you have sentence starters. So I enjoy playing. And again, again, these can be used for different age groups. So if, uh, if it's a young child, the child may just add one word to it. So I enjoy playing football. But if it's an older child, or if you want to expand upon their utterances, you can say, okay, I enjoy playing football and add more details with my friends or with my friends on Saturday or with my friends on Saturday in the nearby park. So again, you can kind of expand upon the different kinds of skills. Uh, another thing, just a jam activity, which is just a minute activity where different objects, real objects can be given or pictures of objects can be given. It's basically like a show and tell thing where children can talk about these things, uh, pick a picture and they can talk at length about these things, say for one minute and so on. So what are the facility activities which you've already said? I'm just going to pull in all these together, help the child understand and ask questions. So it's not important to pose questions to the child, but get them also to ask questions. So you can play the yes, no game, asking questions where they have to give yes or no answers. Respond to questions which require a choice. So you give two choices and the child has to pick a choice and say why he or she made that choice. Expand vocabulary, just, just like I talked about the jam act, uh, you know, the sentence starter act. Don't just say one word or two words, but you know, uh, find, uh, say more uses using that particular word. So for example, you're talking about hand. Okay, this is my hand, that's a basic sentence. But you know, expanding about what all are all the different things you can do with your hand. And as you all suggested, songs, rhymes, uh, you know, different uh, drama, role play, all these help in different aspects of communication. Show and tell, like everybody has already said, like we talked about in the jam activity, you can have real objects or pictures and then they can talk at length about it. Or make a scrapbook or different kinds of materials that they see in the environment and then use that as a conversation starter, as a, a, a starter for speaking and listening. Read to the child, uh, reading stories, start with picture reading and then go on to, you know, uh, naming words, describing, predicting events that happen, questioning things or, you know, um, putting forth, you know, what would happen if the story was different or was happening in a different place or the characters were different and so on. Uh, listen and do activities, just for like the ones I showed through the worksheet, uh, mixing and matching. Sometimes just to engage the children actively, you might have to put two very, irre uh, you know, two in, uh, irregular uh, things that don't go together, together. For example, on a saucer, you can put a shoe and, you know, a picture like that, putting a, a, a shoe on a saucer, which is very awkward. So then get them talking what is wrong with that picture. So that will pick their interest and you can get them to have conversations, think uh, why this is happening, whether that is right or what should be uh, on the saucer instead of the shoe and so on. Play language games, I Spy, Simon Says, all these are very, very common games that we uh, uh, 
do play in our uh, normal life itself and group discussions when you come into higher classes you know have group discussions conversations around topic that you are teaching or different kinds of problem solving situations social situations etc so uh, we are almost coming to an end of this topic talk to the child give the child enough opportunities to talk you be an active listener to when the child is speaking encourage longer conversations better vocabulary not only that you ask questions but let the child also ask questions be a good role model whether you are a good becoming a good listener or a speaker teach all these listening speaking skills very targetedly and then connecting it to the preschool teach phonological awareness skills which are very essential to lead to reading and writing skills later on and when necessary incorporate the help of a speech and language therapist so we come to an end of uh, today's session uh, you know sequential development of all listening and speaking skills all the techniques strategies that are necessary the different kinds of activities that are necessary for this and act, the importance of acting as early as possible so that you minimize the details or gaps in learning by the time they reach school or by the time they go into higher grades is very very important and that's the crux of today's uh, workshop that you know we have to take listening and speaking skills uh, seriously as a matter of uh, academic concern and as an important skill that really affects academic skills so thank you for the patient listening it has been an exhaustive topic i must say and um, i'm open to question and answers now thank you so much ma'am for a very very informative and engaging session with the audience and also sharing with us hands on activities which all our participants can use with their children in improving their listening and speaking skills before we move on to the question and answer round i would like to take the participants to through few important information i would like to inform you all that the upcoming event is on the phonological awareness and sight word recognition to improve reading fluency we have this event on 6th of january at 4:30 pm india time 6 pm indonesia time 7 pm singapore and philippines time the link for this would be posted in the chat box do forward it to those who can benefit with it in addition to the ongoing school program we also have a workshop on strategies and techniques to improve the academic outcomes of children with adhd on the 11th of january by ms shivani vadwa on 4 at 4:30 pm india time 6 pm indonesia time 7 pm singapore and philippines time for our community members the link will be posted in the chat box and you can register for those events now to taking you through the platform for you to be able to access the resources and know about your events you need to first log in and once you log in you will be getting sub tabs you will be having the event details questions resources and related events once you click the question tab you can give the questions for our expert speaker and questions with the most upwards will be considered then in the resources tab we have the resources that we will be sharing for each event the resources for this event will be now shared in the chat box for you all if you would also like to know what are the other related events to the event that you have attended today you can get into the related events tab and all the other related events would appear and if you wish to know what are the events that you have attended as a participant all would be reflecting in the my events section also to inform you all we have come up with a takeaway page where here you will have all the slides that is the presentation of the speaker the overview document resources and the recording available at this page do check out and the link for this is being posted in the chat box do forward the link to those who you think can benefit from it do share the care i would also like to tell you about the other initiative of ability if you are the one who works for children with special needs and have created resources that have been benefited with your learnings you can share it with over 40000 educators and parents you can become a resource creator 
by uploading your resources that you have created or found any other resource to be useful while working for children with special needs. You will receive feedback and ratings from the community. Then you could build followers to your profile. The link to become a resource creator would now be posted in the chat box. Now we'll move on to our Q&A segment. Geeta ma'am, are you ready for the first question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So we have a question ma'am by Asha Sharma, who wants to know that when, how can we identify the listening and speaking problems in early years? Is there any criteria for it? Uh, as I said earlier, during the uh, course of this workshop itself, um, you know, uh, if they are in school already, try and use the school curriculum itself where the speaking and listening skills that are relevant uh, for each, um, you know, each grade level will be mentioned. So use that as an indicator. But otherwise, uh, you know, use the developmental checklist. If it's earlier than the school age or the preschool age, then use the uh, developmental checklist. Some of them I've already mentioned. There are many others also. So, uh, you know, you can use the different kinds of developmental checklists that will always, uh, uh, you know, have a language or a communication domain there. So there will be a list of, uh, you know, age appropriate speaking and listening skills that will be enlisted there. Use that as an indicator. Use that as a guideline to uh, decide where your child is functioning and where you need to take your child from. Thank you for this wonderful insight, ma'am. Now, there's another question by Palise Marion, who wants to know from a parent perspective that how can a parent understand or know that children are facing these listening and speaking challenges and are struggling within? Are there any tips for parents that you would want to give out? See, normally um, you do find uh, this is very noticeable in schools where, you know, when more than one direction is given, especially when it comes to multi-step direction, the children are missing out, you know, for, for example, if two directions have been given, the, uh, the, uh, for, uh, just to give an example, if the teacher has said open to page 56 and uh, go to pa second para, Okay, the child maybe uh, have just got 56. Para two would have been totally off. So, you know, being perceptive to those kind of things. From a parent perspective, you will find that even in at home, you know, when you give multi-step directions, the child is probably only has done half of it or only one part of it, and not done the other. Or if you uh, ask them to do this and this, you know, uh, say you ask the child, you know, pick up the uh, uh, the cups from the uh, table and put it in the sink and soak them there. So maybe the child has just taken and put it in the sink but hasn't soaked them. You know, this is a, I'm just giving an, an example. So when you give these multi-step directions and you find the children are not able to do that, especially with regard to their age range, what is appropriate for their age range, that is indicative of there could be. Uh, you know, listening skills. Uh, speaking, of course, when they express itself, you can make out when you compare with other children, whether their speaking skills are behind their age or not. But listening, because it's more like what goes on inside, it is a bit more difficult to understand. But be perceptive to these kind of uh, things, whether the child is able to uh, carry out. So, uh, you know, or sometimes the, what happens is the child is, you think the child has listened to the instruction, the child takes the stuff, goes, and then forgets what to do next. Goes to the kitchen and then forgets what to do next or where to put it. Or even if you've given them a bag of fruits and asked them to keep it in a particular place in the refrigerator. They might have gone and put it in the refrigerator, but not in the place you've asked them to. So that is an indication, you know, like, okay, the whole direction has not been uh, perceived or listened to actively and acted upon. And this gives you an indication that the child is not able to follow, uh, you know, has some difficulty in listening skills and therefore is not able to um, carry uh, out uh, instructions completely. So they're missing out on things. So these gaps uh, in their performances uh, gives a good indication about whether there are listening skill deficiencies or not. 
being observant is extremely important while figuring out these challenges in children. So now we have another question, ma'am. When we've been talking about implementing strategies, as per you, there is a participant, Genovaev Carillo, who wants to know, can you suggest a best strategy that parents can use at home to develop the skills in children since we cannot visit the therapist during this pandemic? All the things that I talked about now in the workshop, you know, use different kinds of play activities, use uh, anything and everything that you do, uh, bring, you can bring about a speaking and listening component into it. So even if you are, you know, uh, like I said, I've seen a lot of speech pathologists use things like, you know, you, uh, okay, take this toy from the box and uh, go and put it in the, you know, by, go and place it by the door and then come back and do uh, you know uh, shut the box so that is a related activity from the same box they're taking a thing going and putting it by the door leaving it there and then coming back and then and they have to do it in that same order that the instruction has been given and they have to come and shut now this is a related activity so it is easier to follow and a slightly more higher level of listening would be when you give two completely unrelated activities so for example you can say uh, open uh, this box, take this toy, place it by the door, and then go and uh, open the window up. So again, two different activities, but not at all connected. Uh, again, that requires a slightly more higher level of listening skills. So you can do, you can actually sit and do therapeutic activities like this, but you can also incorporate it, especially in the home situation. What I would suggest is in the natural environment itself whatever instructions you are giving, you know, you can use those. Uh, get the child to do different things in the household. Involve them in the household chores that you do, like watering the plants or putting away things in the refrigerator or cleaning up your room. For all this, you, you know, it involves uh, speaking and listening skills. So use, uh, you know, give specific directions to the children in all these areas. Use your everyday natural living environment itself to think of speaking and uh, listening skill development. You don't have to, uh, you know, yes, when, uh, uh, you know, therapists do it, they do it targetedly, but you can also make it as a part of your everyday living because that is what sustains. The child has to be ultimately be functional in the natural environment. So uh, pick out uh, uh, the, uh, the things that you want your child to learn and bring in your speaking, listening component into those activities. Even self-care skills. While you're teaching you know, the child bathing skills or grooming skills, while you're giving the instructions itself, you're, giving, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're getting them to listen and follow those instructions. So if you, even if you look at young children, when they start to uh, you know, bathe themselves, uh, when they are applying the soap, they don't apply it evenly over all the parts. So then as a parent, uh, you know, instead of doing it for them, give directions, you know, say, okay, apply soap on your arms, on your right arm, and then on your left arm, right leg, then on your left leg, then on your tummy, uh, and then wash it off, or, you know, apply now on your face, clean your ears. So again, you're using vocabulary, you're using listening skills, all these promote uh, speaking and listening skills. So it's all there in our environment, uh, pandemic or not, whether you have a therapist or not, you can still work on a lot of these skills while you're in your natural environment. Wonderful hands-on activities shared, ma'am. Now we have another question by Lerma Baptiza, who wants to understand that, does listening depend on the level of comprehension the child has? So when they have to develop listening skills also, is the understanding very important? It is. I mean, we already talked about how development doesn't, uh, you know, happen, happen in isolation. Uh, cognitive skill area, motor skill area, all these happen concurrently. So therefore, if the comprehension level or if there is, as I said, if there's intellectual disability or they have cognitive processing difficulties, definitely it will have an impact on listening skills. Even children who have a specific learning disorder, who have average or above average uh, intellectual functioning, uh, because of the cognitive processing such as attention or perceptual skill deficits or difficulties in those areas, um, all those cognitive processing uh, is vital for language uh, development, for listening skills, for uh, speaking skills. 
So when those are affected, definitely it will have its impact. And therefore, uh, this is why I said when we are doing speaking and listening, don't just think of it as speaking and listening only. You know, it will. Uh, it is better to do it as an activity which has a speaking and listening component also built into it. And that's why I said you can use your daily life activities. You can use your academic activities. You can use your, you know, non-academic activities such as, you know, art, craft, uh, drama or whatever and bring your speaking and listening component to all that. Because uh, doing it in all so many different ways actually boosts speaking and listening skills. And it, uh, it makes it apparent to the child also that you don't have to listen just when you're in school or when the teacher is speaking. You have to be listening actively whenever there is a need to do so, right? And to also widen their horizon of skills. Like I said, it's not enough just to be able to listen to a teacher. Uh, it is also important to be able to appreciate music. It is also important to be able to go to a performance, uh, a drama performance or a dance performance and be able to sit through that, understand that, enjoy that. So uh, there is a wide ranging ramification of all these skill developments. And uh, all these have to be aimed at when we are teaching our skills to the children. So definitely, yes, comprehension plays an important part. Otherwise, reception will always be impaired. All of the skills go hand in hand as stated for holistic development. When we've been talking about the skill sets, ma'am, or when we have children who are facing listening and speaking challenges, we have Mitali Sharma and others who wanted to know which professionals should the child with special needs visit for developing listening and speaking skills. And, uh, and the others also would want to know about the importance of speech and language therapist in developing listening and speaking skills. Uh Definitely when uh, special education, it goes without saying that, uh, you know, when a child has these issues, especially if they're in the preschool and school age, it's more of the special educator along with speech and language therapist. And as I said, if other areas are lacking, you know, the other uh, developmental areas such as sensory motor and all that, you may have to have the help of even other therapists such as the occupational therapist or the um, physiotherapist and so on. Uh, if they have attention issues, uh, you know, and if they uh, need medicines or medicine, medication for to control their ADHD, which is hampering with their listening and speaking skills, definitely you need to make use of the medical professional as well. So it depends. Uh, it goes. Uh, it depends on each child, the kind, the level of severity, their challenges or deficits pose, um, and uh, what is required at each stage. So sometimes a child may require the services of a speech and language therapist early on, but may have, you know, later on, just the special educator would be enough. Uh, whereas uh, I've seen a lot of children with uh, especially SLD, you know, when they had delayed speech early on, even before they started attending school, they've been to a speech and language therapist and, you know, uh, they were able to develop reasonably good functional speech and language. Uh, so by the time they come into school age, they, they may not require the services of a speech and language therapist at that point, but they will still need to work on speaking and listening skills through the special educator, through the regular classroom teacher and so on. So uh, it depends again on child to child. Um, when it is required, it depends on how, uh, how persistent the, the challenge is, how severe the challenge is, and uh, uh, the child's current level of functioning and the child, what is expected of the child at that age level. So the, the gap, the gap in learning between the child's current level of functioning and the child's chronological age and what is expected for that age. So that is what determines whether you need to bring in um, other therapists also alongside. And a lot of times uh, what we have to do is, uh, uh, you know, even if the child is not attending regular speech and language uh, therapy sessions as such, you may need to take their inputs and incorporate those therapy activities into your uh, teaching learning activities in the school or in the remedial sessions so that you are working on those skills. And we do that a lot and particularly with children who have SLD, we do a lot of that. Knowing the skill set and working in collaboration really helps. 
Now we have a question from Shaista Naeem, who wants to know that when children usually grow up and they are in the ages of 12 years, if they are given like multi-step instructions or two to three instructions at a time, they find it very difficult. Can you suggest activities to improve multi-step directions? We basically give multi-step directions and make them do it. And again, you know, if a child has to listen uh, actively, use the different kinds of activities we've talked about, you know, have games. Uh, for example, you can have the Simon Says Games itself. You don't have to keep it single step. You know, in Simon Says Games, you can give multi-step directions and have it like a group game where there is competitiveness and, you know, they want to, they want to perform, right? So all these things uh, really help. So using play or games, both indoor games, outdoor games, that really helps a lot in bringing out more sharper listening. Uh, and as I said, I've seen therapists actually do this, you know, give related multi-step directions and then give unrelated, uh, once they achieve that, then give unrelated uh, multi-step directions, which don't have a logic. You know, the first one and the second one don't connect. Also, another thing is if once we start um, uh, introducing books, workbooks and so on in the school environment, one of the key things I see a lot of um, uh, teachers avoiding is reading the written directions that are given or even using workbooks which don't have directions printed at the top. One thing I insist on is, you know, every worksheet or every book you do, uh, every textbook or every uh, notebook, uh, exercise book uh, activity that you do, it needs to be accompanied by an instruction. And initially the instructions can be single step. And then you can have two or three, uh, you know, depending on what you're trying to train the child. In. So, for example, you can have uh, read the story, give the story. So there's just one step instruction. And after the story, you can uh, write the next step of directions, uh, answer the questions. OK, so you've basically uh, broken it up into two single step directions. You can also give two uh, 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 multi-step directions for the same thing in a more advanced way. Uh, you can say, read the story, answer the, uh, answer the questions given below, uh, and answer the questions given below in complete sentences with the correct punctuation and spelling. So you've given three-step directions for the same thing, right? You've given one story for them to read and some questions. But Instead of breaking it into one direction each, you've given three directions at one go. Either read the, uh, let get the children to read if they can have that reading ability, and then tell it, retell it back to you uh, how uh, what they have to do. So okay, number one, what do we do? Number two, what do we do? Number three, what do we do? And if they've missed any, say okay, let's do number one first. So let's read the story. And after that, ask them okay, what was number two again? So if they don't remember, ask them to go back to the direction and reread them. And in case they can't read them, then you read the directions for them to remind them, okay, this was the second direction. And then, okay, ask them, okay, first one over, second one over, read the story, we did that, answer the questions, we did that, answer the questions in complete sentences. So let's check our answers. Have we answered the uh, questions in complete sentences? Yes, we have. So we followed all the directions as was given. If not, if the child has not done all that, then remind them, okay, see, this were the instructions, this is what you have to do. So multi-step directions is building that into the worksheets you're doing, building that into the activities that you're doing. So you can give it broken down and then slowly you can start adding on the number of instructions you're doing. Very elaborately expressed. And uh, some of the times we also have to give visuals. So it depends. Uh, when I said reading, if they can't read, then give it in the pictorial form. Or sometimes you can give one, lit, uh, you know, one word with a picture attached to it. Read the story and have the child uh, uh, a picture of a child reading a story. So you know the reading is minimal, but then the picture adds on to uh, understanding the direction. Uh, especially with a lot of children who have ASD, listening uh, is, you know, listening to auditory instructions is not exactly their uh, strong point, but they respond very well to visual directions. So sometimes you might have to give the uh, steps of doing something, for example, in pictorial form or give picture with word form. Uh, then slowly after some time, you can remove the pictures. If they get onto the reading, you can just give it as 
wean off the pictures and then get, just give the reading. So there are different ways of giving directions. And this is why with, when it comes to special needs children, you have to look at what their condition is, what their abilities are and what their inabilities are. And therefore, uh, you know, modify your teaching learning process accordingly. So again, it depends on what uh, the child's uh, strengths and uh, challenges are. So according to that, you might have to think of different ways of how to give instructions and how to provide directions to the child. Thank you, ma'am. It actually depends on the condition of the child and build upon the strengths is very, very important. Now we have a case specific question, ma'am, by Sherry, who states that her son has difficulty answering the why questions. She does use in the visual cues, like uh, shows pictures, but can you suggest any strategies so that she could improve her son's difficulty of answering questions? Specifically, uh, why, why questions? The why questions are really difficult. It requires a lot of comprehension and, you know, critical thinking, logical thinking and all that. So um, what you could do is what you're doing is fine giving picture clues and uh, visual clues. That is perfect. But to just to add on to that, you can give choices. You know, sometimes when you give the cues also, they're not able to come out. So, you know, for example, if you've um, asked why is it necessary to wear uh, warm clothes in winter? So probably you can provide uh, clues such as, you know, because it's cold, because it's hot, because it's fun to wear warm clothes, you know. So give certain options and let the child choose those options out of those options. And then when the child chooses it, get the child to speak it completely. You know, I... Uh, we need to wear warm clothes in winter because it, you know, um, uh, it is very cold outside and we need to keep our bodies warm. Uh, so you can extend upon it also. So it, to keep us, uh, to keep out the cold, that is one thing. And then you can ask the other reverse of the question. What will happen if we do not wear warm clothes in winter? So again, it's the same thing, but you know, you're rephrasing it so that the child thinks in a different fashion. So if we do not wear, warm clothes when it is cold outside, you know, you could catch a cold or you could fall sick, your body becomes too cold and you won't be able to do the things you have to do because you're frozen or whatever. So, uh, you know, give those kind of situations and give those um, options. Giving a choice helps, uh, you know, for them to come out towards more plausible answers or even giving leading questions. You know, sometimes you say, okay, the heart is known as the pumping, uh, the pump of the body. Why? Okay, very advanced question. So then the child may not be able to say. So you can give certain clues like, you know, okay, blood circulation or, uh, you know, uh, the way water pumps work. Uh, you know, so give these kind of clues which will ultimately lead the child onto the why, uh, the answer to the why. So giving leading questions also uh, shapes the child's thinking and, uh, you know, directs the child's thinking towards thinking in the way to give the answer to the why. It is not an easy task, but a lot of repetition in different kinds of situations uh, is very, very important. And as far as possible, start with lived experiences. If, it is, if you're uh, giving why questions on something that the child has experienced firsthand, that is even more, uh, you know, um, relatable to the child to be able to give answers rather than something just straight out of the book which the child is not familiar with. so start off with uh, familiar things and then move on to things that the child is not familiar with. moving from the known to the unknown and practice is the key when you have to get children to learn a particular concept we have another case specific question from maria ma'am who wants to understand how can she deal with the child with autism who doesn't want to converse. He feels anxious after asking one or two questions. Uh, with children with ASD, they do have this block or the block in intent to communicate. Even if they are verbal, many of them tend to uh, verbalize minimally or only uh, when it's absolutely necessary. We have to understand that they do have an issue with this. Uh, while we do want them to be as verbal as possible, uh, we should also rem uh, remember that that also causes a lot of undue stress. So uh, let them verbalize as much as possible, but if need be, 
you know, accept alternate means of communication. Now, there were children who, in my class, who I taught earlier, children with ASD who were verbal. I mean, they can speak, but if they have to suddenly say request water, uh, you know, uh, or request to go to the washroom in the class, in the large classroom setting, suddenly they wouldn't raise their hand or they wouldn't stand up and ask for it. Uh, because uh, uh, some of these children with ASD have a big block in initiating the, uh, a, a communication. So, uh, you know, one of the things I used to do was, you know, they would have these uh, little cards, little flashcards with washroom, with a picture of washroom or water or something like that. Or sometimes they may even need to, they may be getting very agitated because of the sensory overload in the classroom. And they want to, uh, you know, convey to the teacher that they need a break or they need to go into a calm down area. And normally we used to have those. If you're thinking of inclusive settings, we do have a calm down place or a calm down corner in the classroom where the child can just retreat and calm themselves down. So, uh, you know, they may need to request these kind of things, but, you know, they may not do it verbally because they have this big block when it comes to initiating. And in such cases, you know, I used to have, uh, these children used to have these little uh, absolutely necessary flashcards, especially for conveying immediate needs and wants um, in their pouch, pencil pouch, or, you know, uh, in their pockets, and they could just fish out whichever they need. So they could still communicate uh, without having to go through the struggle of uh, trying to verbalize it. So, you know, uh, you may have to think of alternate ways of how you can make the communication easier without always insisting on verbalization if the verbalization is a big hurdle for the child. So again, you know, the aim is to include the child as much as possible with their diversities and accommodate for that. Very insightful answer, ma'am. Now we have a question from Colette and Savele who wants to know that when it comes to improving the speaking skills, does AAC devices, do the AAC devices play a significant role to initiate speech, the augmentative and alternative communication techniques? See, um, uh, one of the first and foremost things we do with most children uh, is try and initiate as much of verbalization as possible. Um, because that is the most natural way of, uh, you know, com uh, expressive communication, verbal speech or speak. But having said that, again, there are, um, you know, there are special needs conditions where this may be very limited. And, um, uh, uh, you know, like I said, with ASD or children with CP, but uh, there, is, there are certain conditions known as selective mutism, where, uh, you know, initiating a conversation is very hard for them. Or... Uh, maybe their verbalizations will be very limited by vocabulary or by the intent to communicate. But if they use an um, alternative, uh, you know, for example, if they're verbalizing, they may be just verbalizing one word, one keyword. Whereas if they're using the AAC, they may actually be able to uh, tap in and generate a sentence. And the AAC device will play the sentence to you. So they're uh, actually becoming more effective communicators through using the AAC device. So it is very important that again, as I said, when we say speaking and listening, when it comes to children with special needs, we may have, we always have to remember that ultimately inclusion is the, is the, uh, the bigger goal. So if, you, if they have to be included, they have to become as effective communicators. And it may not always be through, uh, through the traditional speaking and listening ways. So if they have to use the AAC devices, so be it. Whatever makes them better effective communicators, that's what is important. A lot of people on the spectrum, for example, once they develop reading and writing skills, many of them communicate uh, very well through typing or through written expression. You know, uh, they, would, they would be able to type the uh, things or even there are even children who are write books and write poems uh, uh, children who are on the spectrum who have been doing things like this. But when it comes to even speaking a sentence or, uh, you know, answering in even a, in a simple sentence verbally, that might be difficult. So whatever is possible, as I said, again, you know, uh, try to remediate and ameliorate their uh, challenge areas, but at the same time, draw upon their strengths 
uh, and you know rely also more heavily upon their strengths so that become they become much more effective communicators and aac is not always just a substitute it can be used as a supplement to whatever verbalization they have because that may uh, and for some children it may be a total substitute some children may be totally non verbal so you know they may have to rely entirely on uh, say uh, sign language or aac devices and so on so again it depends on child to child uh, the norm is as much verbalization as we they can produce we try and you know stimulate that and give intervention services for that but the aim ultimately is total communication and for total communication if they require aac or you know sign language or any other modality so since we have been spoke, speaking about a lot on the child on the spectrum himanshu mehta wants to know that are rhymes useful tools for children with autism to improve their speaking ability it does help because um, uh, quite a few times in my experience i've seen uh, children with asd are very receptive to rhythm music so rhymes follow that pattern and Uh, many of them do have some musical inclinations rhythms usually have a numerical quality to it like you have the beats so when you use rhymes you know you can set it to beats which makes it um, very exact you know uh, languages are not really exact in that sense but when you have certain counts or certain beats those are more exact sciences um, and uh, children with the asd do uh, seem to like uh, you know uh, respond more um, more uh, uh, are more receptive to these kind of exact sciences so you find that generally they have uh, they may have more difficulty in the language area rather than in the math area so therefore you know uh, rhymes rhythm beats all these things do help and as i said you know do not be bound by only you can do only this way or that way whichever way works best for the child you know be open and flexible enough to use multiple ways to reach out to the child so if uh, rhythms and rhymes are helping you know definitely you know a lot of those things even hard hardcore concepts can be given in the forms of songs and rhymes and can be taught to children and they will learn better through that so you have to realize what is the way they learn best and use those kind of activities to further their uh, skills their learning style knowing which kind of a learner are they visual kinesthetic or auditory makes it much easier to help these children we have a question ma'am by noramiti and binti and hasan and others who want to know that when we have been speaking a lot about strategies and implementing them how can we assess whether or not these special needs children are progressing in their listening and speaking abilities it is as i said when we are planning also you know we use a checklist or a guideline or a curriculum right so when we are setting out the objectives uh, we have those guidelines that we are following so it is taking them through those domains to through those skills so use whichever curriculum you are using or whichever checklist you are using you know once uh, you uh, once you uh, uh, do the activities and you find normally we say like you know at least 8 out of 10 times if the child is performing that skill consistently enough then you know uh, you can go on to the next skill so generally we talk about 80% accuracy which is like 8 out of 10 times if the child is able to perform fairly consistently then you can move on to the next skill but uh, remember with special needs children the previous skills also have to be refreshed so how you know is basically you you have set out a particular goal measure it up against that particular goal itself whether the child is able to do that uh, what we do in special ed is we do a task analysis that is breaking down the task into different components so if you uh, you can uh, uh, grade them on each of the comp, uh, the steps of the task and whether the child is able to do step number 1 step number 2 step number so for example if you are setting out a goal on multi step direction following you know you maybe the current level is the child is able to uh, follow one step direction so start off with the uh, one step 
give activities for two steps or multi steps, whatever. And then at the say you are setting that goal for three months or six months for however long you are setting your uh, aim and objective or based upon your IQ. And then at the end of that time duration, you know, again, give uh, these activities and see whether the child is able to achieve that. So everything depends upon what is the objective that you have set out in the beginning. So measure it up against the objective. Or if it's a, just one, a one time activity kind of thing, you can say, okay, eight out of 10 times, the child will be able to perform that uh, consistently. So if you're giving three step directions, okay, eight out of 10 times, the child is able to carry out the three step directions. Uh, well, perform, a, uh, act, a, uh, follow those directions. So that will be your criteria, and then you can move on. Knowing how much development has happened in a particular skill helps us to know the progress. We have a question by Mariel K. Ma'am, who wants to know that is it possible that epilepsy can affect the development of a child when it comes to speaking and listening skills? Well, see, epilepsy, actually, every time the child has an epileptic attack, it is believed that, you know, some kind of uh, damage does happen, which is why we say when, the uh, you know, a child who has epilepsy, definitely medical intervention is very, very important. Following the medication is important so that you prevent the occurrence of these epileptic attacks, because it is with each attack, there is some kind of, uh, you know, damage to the brain cells. And we all know that when it comes to language processing and when it comes to any kind of development, including speech and language development, definitely the brain is an important part. I mean, we've been talking about listening and speaking skills. So it is not, uh, it is the connection between the sensory organ and the brain and the processing that goes on there, which, you know, which uh, starts this receptive expressive language process. So definitely, if uh, epilepsy is causing brain damage in, you know, we, in certain areas, it could definitely uh, impede development in all areas or maybe certain specific areas. So that will have its impact in the speaking and listening area as well. So any child with epilepsy, the first and foremost thing is medical intervention to control the epileptic attacks uh, and minimize it or, and, or bring it down completely. So it is very important that medication is given due importance and followed uh, almost religiously, uh, you know, to, to the point of, you know, uh, how the medication needs to be taken, when it needs to be taken, uh, so that recurrence is uh, avoided. And if it does recur or uh, if a recurrence has, you know, the doctor will direct you on that. If uh, for a certain number of months or years, uh, the medication has been applied and the child is not getting any more epileptic attacks, then they will uh, try to reduce and taper the dosage slowly and, you know, if possible, take the child off medication. But again, it's done very carefully, gradually. So it is important to follow the right kind of medical advice when it comes to children who have epilepsy. And it is not just speaking and listening, it will have its impact Every fit has its impact in de developing in, uh, development in all areas. Epilepsy actually needs a medical intervention for you to be able to help your child better. We'll take the last question for the day, ma'am. Uh, this is a question by Chote Tinle and the others who state that at times there are parents who are in denial to get their child assessed from professionals. How can we convince them? to help their child better? Uh, yeah, very. this is always a recurrent question, I think, in almost all workshops. Um, the thing is, if, again, with visible uh, conditions, such as ASD or, you know, uh, um, CP, intellect, global developmental delay, when there is a significant uh, visible impairment, uh, pay, uh, generally, parents are more willing to go and have their child assessed uh, because uh, they know that you know it's more physical; it's very observable. Uh, the The key is give as much awareness of uh, to the parents as possible because uh, what you have to give them is a uh, long vision approach. So you know, tell them that if they ch take their child now, 
uh, what their child needs to have at this particular age and what the, the, the gaps that the child has now is very minimal and it is easier to intervene and you know, get the child back on track if you act early. But otherwise the gap tends to widen and a lot of early uh, developmental, uh, you know, early developmental stages when the brain, the nervous system is more, more um, receptive of the changes that you can put in through by way of therapies, by way of stimulation, uh, when it is more open to receiving that and more progress can be seen if that valuable time is lost, then when you go much later on, the gaps would have widened and you more, your, the therapies that you do would not have as much, uh, you know, as much uh, effect and benefit to the child. So it is in the best interest of the child and the child's, uh, you know, uh, as much as possible, get the child performing to its, to his or her fullest potential possible, that early identification and stimulation or, uh, um, you know, uh, intervention is necessary. At the end of the day, we have to remember uh, the more awareness we give, we can only hope that the parents will take that on board. Uh, but ultimately, the decision does uh, rest with the parents. And as professionals, we have to uh, take it that if we deal with, say, 100 parents, there may be a few we simply fail to convince. That's the reality of the situation. But efforts are on to convince them to give them. You can even give them you know, things like audiovisual uh, videos to watch give them print materials to read upon. Nowadays, the internet is there. You can even direct them to you know, suitable sites where they can find more information. So they don't have to even necessarily depend on one th what one therapist or one professional is saying. They can go and look for more options you know, and then be convinced and come back. So usually I try a multitude of uh, things with the parents and uh, you know, I even suggest websites and things that they go on and read up etc and usually most of them do come around some of them don't come around then but then they do come around later on which is very unfortunate for the child because a lot of valuable time has been lost but then uh, that is life that is the reality of the situation so use different ways of getting down to them con to convince them but ultimately it's the parents decision Awareness is the key. We need to psychoeducate as much as possible from our end for them to understand the importance of it. And then, as ma'am stated, the call is of the parents. Thank you so much, Geeta ma'am, for patiently answering all the questions that our participants had posed. And a lot of them, in fact, patiently answering and sharing wonderful insights about activities, hands-on practices that they can readily use at home with children of all age groups to improve their listening and speaking skills. Now, I will also take them through the upcoming events again. I would like to inform you all of the upcoming events that we have again. The links of it would be posted in the chat box. You could share it with anyone who can benefit. We have Geeta ma'am who would be... Um, taking upon phonological awareness and sight word recognition to improve reading fluency on 6th of January 2022 on at the time 4.30 p.m. India time, 6 p.m. Indonesia time, 7 p.m. Singapore and Philippines time. In addition to the ongoing inclusive school program, we have the strategies and techniques to improve the academic outcomes of children with ADHD on 11th January by Ms. Shivani Vadva on 4.30 p.m. India time, 6 p.m. Indonesia time and 7 p.m. Singapore Philippines time. The links have been posted in the chat box. Book your slot. See you all at the sessions. Geeta ma'am, would there be a message from you before we could end the session? Uh, yeah, it's become very customary to give a <laughs> wrap-up note. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And, um, you know, whatever uh, experience I've gained from my lived experiences, if I can share it with the the forum that you provide, the platform that you provide with such wonderful participants. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure. So thank you uh, once again. I did enjoy this and I hope uh, it has been useful to the participants who have uh, taken part in this workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. 
until we see you again in the next year team ability wishes you and your family a merry christmas and a very happy new year a big bye from team ability take care and stay safe